Hi everyone, thank you for joining our PR webinar. We're gonna give it a few minutes to let everyone um, join in and then we'll get started. Hi to everyone who's now joining us. We'll give it one more minute, just to let everyone um, join the webinar and then we'll get started. Great, it's 12. So I think we'll get started now. So thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join us for the webinar today on maximizing PR to your advantage. Um, on the call today, I've got James and George from JNH Communications and along with Sahil from the Big Gift team. Just before we start, I'm gonna go through a few quick house rules. So today's session will run as a Q&A format so James and George will present for the first half of the webinar, and then you can ask your questions. So if you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom panel, you'll be able to ask questions throughout the session, which we'll ask to um, James and George at the end. If you want to introduce yourself, please feel free to use the chat, chat function um, and use that throughout the session. There's also a transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Please do enable this if you'd like to see subtitles um, throughout the webinar. And also just for um, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. So you were able to see um, the recording of the webinar along with the webinar slides again once the session has ended. So without further ado, I'll pass on to Jules and James. Thanks very much, Beth. Um, it's great to uh, um, meet and see as many of you here this morning. Uh, and hopefully what James and I will run through will be um, interesting and useful to you when you come to engage with the media around the Big Gives Christmas Challenge, which kicks off in a few weeks time. Um, before we go into what we're gonna be covering today, a little bit about us. Uh, we're j &H Communications. Uh, we're a PR firm based in Soho in London. Uh, and uh, we've got a variety of clients. Uh, some are private companies, some are private individuals, some are charities, some are listed companies um, across the full spectrum, across a range of sectors and industries. I've been doing PR for about 25 years and we're delighted to be working with the Christmas Challenge and Big Give. Over to you, James. Hello, everybody. Uh, likewise, it's a pleasure to uh, join you all today. Um, I was a journalist for most of my career. Uh, I was trained in local newspapers, which I still maintain is the best uh, training ground, uh, before going on to be political editor of the Daily Mail. Uh, I then worked for the government for a while, uh, doing comms, uh, worked at the Treasury um, for several years before um, founding JNH with George and another colleague about four or five years ago. So if we move on to the contents of what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to start off with what is PR, uh, sort of PR 101, and then the role of the media, what they're looking for, and understanding um, the sort of context of the media and journalists' day-to-day -day life, media relations, and then actually what the key takeaway for you, everybody today is what makes a good story. What are the journalists looking at in terms of storylines and angles? Then we look at the benefit of using good quality photography and images and the kind of narrative you're using. Then some key points to always bear in mind when dealing with the media, the kind of do's and don'ts, uh, what they like to hear about and when they like to hear from you, what to say and what not to say. Then Beth's going to run through a big give case study and then specifically on the comms program uh, for the Christmas campaign this year. And then we move on to a Q&A at the end. 
I mean, I think it's worthwhile just reminding everybody about the importance of the Christmas campaign. I mean, Big Give has been going for, I think, 15 years. It's been phenomenally successful uh, supporting thousands of charities. And last year alone, the Christmas campaign raised £24 million, uh, which supported over 900 charities. So it's a really important event. Uh, it's really exciting. It's really good fun. Uh, and hopefully today's session will be uh, beneficial to you all. So next slide, please. Uh, and as I said, the, the purpose of today is how to get the most out of the media when pushing your story so that donors give more. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's an important time for you all, the Christmas campaign, and we want to um, help you by running through um, you know, the best aspects of getting the most out of your um, media engagement. So what is PR? Uh, fundamentally, PR is the uh, persuasion business, the business of persuading journalists uh, to write your story in as uh, positive a light as possible. And we're storytellers, James and I, fundamentally. Whether you're a, a company or an individual or a charity, uh, we articulate and uh, convey your story, your narrative to journalists and, and try and we can never tell them what to write, but we can try and influence and shape how they represent your story in the newspaper or on an online article or on a broadcast TV, radio interview or a podcast. And PR is, is uh, as many of you will know, because you will be uh, the PRA uh, in-house PRs for the, for the charities working with Big Give, you know, it can, it can be used to repair your reputation if it's been damaged for whatever reason. Uh, you can help build your profile and reputation through the media. Uh, and indeed, you can use PR directly on your websites. You don't have to go to the journalists. You can have a story on your, uh, you know, on your homepage or whatever part of your website and talk directly to your audiences or stakeholders. Um, the key thing, and we'll come on to this later, is identifying interesting, positive, upbeat stories that are going to appeal to the media and, and the public. They want to read interesting, insightful content. And in this context of media relations, often for a lot of you, it's going to be people who care about the causes that you're, you're championing, or indeed in the locality in which you're based, because I know a lot of you may struggle to get national uh, uh, newspaper or, or broadcast coverage, but you're probably quite likely to get local or regional media interest in your story. Uh, PR is a competitive game. There are a lot of people trying to get column inches in newspapers, magazines, and uh, on broadcast outlets. There are a lot of people vying to get their voices heard. So, being prepared, really thinking about how you're going to pitch your story and knowing what to say, when to say it and how to say it is really very important and it improves your chance of, of getting noticed. Um, now, PR encompasses many different disciplines. It could be strategic communications, crisis comms. It could be corporate and financial comms if you're buying or selling a company. Uh, or hiring a chief exec, or you've had to make people redundant, or you've had to use, you know, the furlough scheme, or one of the projects that your charity is involved in is, is has, has had an issue, uh, and you could be running around trying to repair the damage after it. But I think for the purposes of today, first and foremost, you want to be telling people about the activities that you're going to be doing in relation to Big Gifts Christmas Challenge, and potentially how much money you want to raise or have raised uh, for this event and how people can maybe get involved. So I think around the Big, big Give Christmas Challenge storytelling, it's going to be pretty straightforward and all positive and upbeat. So maybe, James, do you want yeah. to talk about this? Because you were obviously the journalist, you're far better equipped. With my journalist hat on, yeah, the role of the media. So most journalists will tell you that they they see their role as providing accurate information. They want to get things right. Uh, they like to be seen to hold power to account, um, whether that's local power or national power, and they like to entertain and at the same time inform. Um, the media landscape has changed a great deal over the last few years. Um, so traditional outlets, such print outlets have uh, declined in popularity. A lot, a lot of activities moved online. 
but there's no doubt that the media still plays a huge role in um, in everyone's lives, uh, whether you're a creator of content or a consumer of that content. Um, local media will be um, a lot of what you're dealing with day to day, and I'm sure most of you have contacts with your local media. Um, local newspapers, which I started out in, are sadly denuded now, so the staff has been staff has generally been cut. But um, some of these local websites, news websites, are doing pretty well um, uh, in shifting activity online. So um, I, it's interesting to note that um, uh, if you look at polling on trust in the media, local print online and uh, TV and radio are the most trusted trusted types of media. They're much more trusted than uh, the national outlets. Um, and local media would argue uh, that they're activities actually necessary to a healthy functioning of, um, of civil society and democracy. Um, journalists like to campaign, they like to provoke debate, um, and they like to, as I said earlier, hold people accountable. So um, where they can use a story that you're telling to highlight a broader issue or a broader trend, um, uh, they, will like, they will want to do that. They also like to be seen to be lubricating commerce or perhaps more relevantly uh, today, philanthropic giving. So there are specialist reporters in all those areas. And they like to be seen to be playing a part in, uh, in the culture. So the local culture, uh, they, they want to um, shed a light on what people are doing locally and nationally. If we could move on to the next slide. Um, it's good to have an understanding of how journalists work. So they're working very quickly. Uh, journalists' day is a succession of deadlines, and that has changed in the last few years. Um, most journalists will now be filing for an online website, as well as a print, traditional print deadline, which would have come at the end of the day. So try and understand and get an understanding of, um, of the journalists that you're dealing with, what the deadlines are that they have to meet. Ask them directly, when is the best time for me to contact you? because all journalists will have parts of the day when they want to be hearing from you, they'll have parts of the day when they definitely don't. All journalists want news. Um, uh, the clue is in the name. They want something uh, recent and current and something different. And their job is to simplify complex issues. So they'll be looking to you to uh, translate complex issues into, um, uh, into a manner that people can readily understand. Um, I always used to say to people I was interviewing um, uh, that if I don't understand it, then my readers aren't going to understand it. So you need to talk in um, in simple terms and translate complex ideas and issues into um, a format that everybody will, will be able to follow. They have um, mostly uh, restricted formats, even online, although um, uh, online is obviously a freer format than print. Generally, there'll be a um, there'll be a style, a house style. There'll be a house typical length of a story, and there will be a number of people that they'll want to quote. Um, journalists have to make choices. They can't be completely exhaustive. They will choose an angle, and so the challenge for us and for you is to um, is to try and identify an angle that will appeal to them and guide them in that direction. So uh, why bother with media relations? And this is the whole crux of why we're here today. And it's, I'm not trying to tell you to suck eggs here, but it's fundamentally, it's all about improving their understanding of your charity and your cause. Why are you existing? Why is the charity bothering to help these individuals? Um, you know, what is your purpose? Um, media relations is also there to drive donor activity and support, as I said at the start. Uh, you want people to be as generous as possible to you. And if you tell a good story and make it compelling and make them realize the benefits that you are giving to that uh, uh, cause, then they're more likely to dig deeper and more frequently. Um, media relations is also good because it helps not only secure positive coverage, but it helps establish relationships. So you, the in-house or in-agency uh, PRs and also uh, your, say, head of fundraising or your chief exec or managing director of your charity, if they can speak to the journalist around the Christmas challenge and what you're doing next month, 
And that sets you up well for other opportunities when you're doing interesting, exciting fundraising activities or launching a particular campaign or launching a, a, a new initiative in your charity and you're trying to get other press coverage. If you've got that rapport and relationship uh, established now, so when you come to do something else next year, you're in a good position. And it's all about getting front of mind and enhancing your visibility. So the more people can see you, the more eyeballs you get on your story. And you can see here you got, uh, I think that's Phoebe Waller-Bridge in the Evening Standard there. Um, you know, if you get front page news or even the Keithley News up, I think in Yorkshire or the Halifax Courier, they're looking, you know, that's a call to arms. Can you help our hospice here? And clearly the paper think the hospice is a really important uh, charity building, really important in the local community. So they stuck up on the front page. So the more relevant and important you make it, the more likely the journalist and the editor of the newspaper and the magazine, whatever, they'll give you the appropriate splash, be it front page or whatever. So media relations matters and it's, and it, and it, and it's worth taking the time to get it right. What makes well, a good story? Talk, Maybe this is, yeah, one for James here, I think probably. I'll talk a bit about what makes a good story, um, having written a fair few in my time. I mean, lots of people assume that journalists are only interested in in uh, negative um, uh, stories, exposés or sensationalist stories. That's not actually the case. Um, in my experience, most journalists are interested in, in good stories. Um, and those are ones that interest people or surprise people. Um, I think a really important point that I would make today is that for stories to be accessible, it needs, they need to involve real people, um, the, hum the human interest angle. People like to read and hear about other people. Um, so wherever you can illustrate what you're talking about with case studies, um, people that you've helped, people willing to um, talk about the impact of what you're doing, who have an interesting story to, or, or an emotional story to tell, a compelling story to tell, wherever you can, bring it back to the individual, um, because that's, those are the stories that are most going to appeal to uh, the journalists that you're dealing with. Then there are various elements to a good news story, um, which I'll talk through now. So firstly, you've got to get the right information. That's the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. If a pitch that you're making is ignored, it's often because a journalist considers that it lacks the substance that they need, uh, which is all that, all that basic information. So think about the facts and the details that you need to include before you pitch a story. Then think about the significance. Um, a story may be very important to you, um, but a dry story of a sort like meeting a fundraising target uh, may be very important to you, um, but is that of compelling interest to the outlet's readers, listeners or viewers that you're trying to reach? Think about the focus of what you are, uh, of the story you're trying to tell. A good story is limited and it's, and it's sharply focused stick to a core cool story idea and stay focused in that. Um, we talked earlier about the, trying to identify the best news angle, um, and that may be an individual story, it may be, uh, it may be an appeal, it may be setting uh, a campaign that you're um, running within a national trend. Um, you can't control how ultimately how a reporter decides to write up a story that you're working on with them, but you can guide them on the path to the story angle that you, uh, that you want them to follow. Think about the context um, and try and offer some perspective. So at the moment, we're, this Christmas appeal is gonna be in the um, context of a cost of living crisis that's dominating the national news and dominating our politics. Is there a way you can set what you're doing uh, into a wider, a wider context it goes beyond the single cause that you are representing. So journalists love to report about tr on trends um, that you're seeing, um, issues that uh, are, are arising in, uh, in your experience. So can you tie your story pitch back to that kind of thing? We've talked about the importance of involving individuals. So good stories involve interesting characters. I think we've lost James. Oh. 
we can give it a second to see if he comes uh, comes back to us. Otherwise, uh, I think George may have to uh, take over. Okay, he's dropped off. Why don't I, um, I can carry on. Um, yes, so the, the, the personal human interest element is very important. And as point five says, it's the faces, it's the characters. Um, who's going to be the face of your story or your pitch? Have you got the individuals uh, and the color behind them? And they should really be, un they should understand clearly what you're going to be what you are talking about in your pitch and be passionate about the story. If you're um, uh, flat and uh, unaware and don't know the, the key nuts and bolts of the story that you're pitching to the journalist and you're not excited and passionate and it doesn't come across in your tone of voice, whether it's the written word or spoken word, uh, it's going to probably fall flat on its face. Um, and in terms of form, you know, it's giving them shape, the stories, giving them context, give the reader and the journalist a sense of completion, uh, giving them a well-rounded set of facts and figures and sources of the story, guide them, don't, don't uh, leave any sort of information vacuum, don't, making, don't make a sort of passing assertion uh, or, or glib comment in any press release and not give any context. Uh, and I'm sure you wouldn't do that, but you'd be surprised how sometimes there's an assumed level of knowledge, particularly about a, a niche charity. And we're talking about 900 plus charities that are involved in a Christmas challenge for Big Give. Um, in terms of voice, we've mentioned this earlier, um, you know, it's, it's good, concise quotes from maybe the people who have benefited from the uh, fundraising efforts of your charity. Uh, and it's all about bringing it to life. It's, it's giving that human perspective and angle. So if you remember most of what's on that page, you've got a reasonable chance of, of getting heard. Next slide, please. Um, images, high impact images and photography. Um, so what you see here uh, is one of our clients at GNH Communications. It's Nightember, the English sparkling wine brand. You may well have heard about, they're about 30 years old and they are seen as a sort of pioneer in the English wine industry. Uh, and they've enjoyed great success. Um, and the purpose of this slide is to show that um, you don't just have to have boring bottles of wine, as you can see on that uh, uh, Times Lux, or, uh, Lux uh, article in the middle, but also, for example, in the winter months, they have sheep that graze amongst the vineyards. And you'd be surprised about the amount of photographers from the newspapers and indeed the picture editors at the newspapers love those kind of shots. They also like having people picking grapes and you've got a lady there walking down the uh, vineyard aisles with two buckets and indeed there's a lady there with her colleagues crouching down picking stuff there. Uh, and you'll see how different that is to the chief executive on the right hand side is on Sky News. Uh, he's being interviewed there and he's in actually a cellar uh, in his house. Uh, which has bottles behind it. So having an interesting, exciting, compelling image uh, really can make a whole world of difference. And often, if you and I are reading a newspaper or magazine, we'd often look at that eye-catching uh, eye catching image on a page, read the caption underneath it, we won't really bother to read the other uh, articles, the column inches elsewhere on the page. You'll tend to go to the pictures first. So really think about the photos you're taking. Try and include people doing something. That's what the picture editors and journalists are looking for. If you go to the next slide, um, I'll maybe let James speak to this one. I'm glad to see you're back, James. Sorry, our, our office internet uh, went down I'm so with exquisite timing, but uh, it's back now. And don't worry, we're just talking about images. So maybe just give the guys a quick overview here. You've got Sarah Dutchess of York doing various things around the world. Yeah, I mean, the three things that are important are images, uh, uh, obviously the overlaps of photography and the narrative. Um, we work with Street Child um, and uh, their founder patron is Sarah Duchess of York. And we developed a really clear narrative for them on um, their mission, trying to define that. Uh, essentially, it was that there are 120 million children out of school around the world. And the aim, everybody's aim and everything we said was about ending that scandal. 
Um, so we used individual children's stories um, to, to, to um, illustrate um, how much of an impact it could have on children's lives when Street Child was able to bring education to areas where it was lacking. Um, we used powerful imagery from field trips. So we took the Duchess to, you can see there in the hello coverage, we took the Duchess to um, a, um, a, a rubbish dump in Sierra Leone where um, very poor families um, were picking through the rubbish for to make a living. And, uh, and Street Child opened a school there and brought education to that, um, to that community. Um, we um, put the Duchess out in the field. So you can see um, Good Morning Britain uh, carried a live interview with her from Sierra Leone, where Street Child was again uh, opening a school. Um, so it's the power of imagery, it's the power of the story. And it was making it a simple, compelling story about the scandal of children out of education and ending that. And that we brought all communication activity um to bear on that on that one goal and i think before we before we move off this slide i think it's worth mentioning a bit about broadcast you know every and with, particularly with night timber who are based in west sussex and a lot of the english sparkling wine brands are based in southern england you know bbc south uh it covers everywhere from Oxfordshire down to Dorset, down to Sussex. And every morning, all the BBC news channels are on BBC One. They have usually six to nine, three hours to fill. And they're desperate for content. Uh, not desperate, but they really uh, love it if you approach them and say, we're doing this in three days' time or next week. We've got we're a local charity. We've got lo loads of local people involved. It's for a great cause. It's this novel, unique event, the initiative we're doing, whatever it is. You know, it'd be great to get your cameras down. It's really exciting. It'd make a really good piece uh, while people are having their breakfast. Da, 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 da. And, and you, you'd be surprised how interested. Don't shy away from TV uh, broadcast interviews. Uh, we've all watched breakfast telly and the BBC in particular uh, is very keen on, you know, covering interesting local causes and initiatives. And they've got three hours to fill every morning. Uh, so if you give them notice, you know, more often than not, one of their radio or TV reporters could come down to whatever you're doing and speak to one of your uh, team, be it someone at the at the. At, at the place that you're actually having your event or your chief exec of your charity whoever it is don't shy away from broadcast um you know getting someone in front of a camera or a microphone can be very impactful so um we're going to talk now about some do's and don'ts in terms of dealing with the media a lot of you will have experience with this already but um others may be just starting out on the media journey so always do your research on the reporter and the outlet before um, you engage with them. Um, most journalists uh, are on Twitter these days, so have a look at their social media, give yourself an idea of their interests and the sorts of stories that they are writing. Do We were just talking about the core messages that we helped develop for Street Child. Come, do boil it down to a really fundamental core message, a one-line summary of um, the most important points that you want to make. And if you are doing a, George was just talking about broadcast interviews, um, don't be afraid of um, starting an interview if you're on, if you're on local radio or television, um, whatever the first question, this is a trick that politicians used to use when I was working for the government, whatever the first question may be, you can start by saying, I'll, I'll come on to that, but let me start by saying this and then get your one line core message in first. Always be friendly. We've talked about the importance of um, building relationships um, uh, that could be mutually beneficial in the future. Do prepare uh, and be as specific as you can in that preparation for tricky or difficult questions if you think they might, they might come. Keep it simple. We've talked about journalists as translators of complex ideas. Um, talk to your values. Try and avoid technical jargon, which is very off-putting. Just uh, you know, leave acronyms out of it. Don't assume that people know those. Keep everything that you're saying simple and accessible. Always try to say something newsworthy and different. Um, what is the news line in what you're saying? What, what, is the, what is the news angle that the outlet's going to be interested in? Try and illustrate what you're saying with a real world anecdote um, or a third party endorsement to illustrate what you're saying. 
um, always um, offer to um, provide additional information if the journalist has the writing story up um, uh, needs to come back to you make and you should really do that any time of day or night I mean because journalists don't work normal hours be prepared to take that call at 7 p.m if a journalist is on deadline and they've there's something that they need to clarify or check with you. Um, if you feel you've failed to address something important or you've missed something out in the briefing that you've given a journalist, don't be shy of sending an email, a follow-up email, um, if you want to do, if you want to clarify or add something that you feel is important, that will be very welcomed by most journalists. If we move on to don'ts, this may go without saying, I hope it does, don't ever lie to a journalist. Don't say anything that you wouldn't want to see in print or on air unless you have specifically agreed with a journalist in advance that the interview will be off the record or a part of it will be off the record. Assume otherwise um, that uh, even you know, casual remarks you're making might end up being used in print. Don't go beyond your area of expertise and don't engage in speculation. Journalists would much rather you said, I just don't know the answer to that. To that. I can look into it for you or put you in touch with somebody who might be able to come up with an answer um, than you seeking to make something up as you go along. Don't use the phrase no comment. It looks defensive and journalists hate it. If you really can't answer a question, deflect it by saying, I'm sorry, I just can't respond to that, but let me address this issue instead. If you're doing interviews, um, this, this is really relating mainly to broadcast interviews or you're briefing a one of, your, um, one of your senior people for an interview. Remember that giving a media interview is essentially a performance and the success of uh, an interview is 95% in the preparation, 5% improvisation. So do have a rehearsal if you're do doing TV or radio, uh, particularly if you're not used to doing it. Um, do go over the core messages that you want to deliver so that you make sure you deliver those at the top of what you're saying. Um, and be ready for anything. Beth, if you could I think you run through the Big Gives case study. Sure, yeah, no worries. Uh, let me just stop the video. Um, so yeah, we have a case study that was taken from the Cheney Heritage Foundation. And essentially a week before the Big Give campaign began, they sent out a press release titled The Horse and His Boy. And you can see on that on the side. And it talks about how a unique partnership gave the gift of communication. And you can see that um, in the Argus there. And this helped strengthen their story and um, telling approach by focusing the message on the friendship that was built between Finn and Nick Knack and the impact this friendship had on Finn. So again, talking about that impact um, specifically. And then the press release garnered great coverage and was published on over 20 online local news pages, making it to the page three of the Argus. So um, a really great example of a success story from one of our Christmas Challenge charities. And just kind of a note here that we do have some more case studies available in the support section of the charity portal if you wanna have a look at some more examples. And I'll also do this slide. So I just wanted to go over some highlights of what the Big Give um, are also doing, because I know that um, comes up in quite a few charity questions. So I've put here like the key headline um, information of what we're doing kind of before, during the launch day and over the Christmas challenge week. So from the week before the Christmas challenge, we're gonna have that promotion video available, which we'll share with all of you charities. We're working on a 15 year anniversary report um, that we're hoping to launch again around that week. And we're gonna be doing a lot of press releases and coverage over that report in particular, but also case studies on charities. Um, and we're also sharing upcoming, the upcoming campaign with our charity and philanthropic networks. So again, getting people prepared and aware of the upcoming campaign, the incentive behind the match funding and the importance of how this campaign is going to help all of the charities involved. So the launch day in particular, we're going to be doing lots of social media posts on the Big Give platform. So if you haven't already, it'd be great to follow us, tag us in your posts, and we can share those as well to get as much impact as possible. We'll be launching um, an email to over 19,000 um, supporters that we have on our database. 
we'll be sharing some individual celebrity videos um, that we're working with charity partners to create. Um, there'll be lots of posts from our big big partners, so people like Reed, people like Giving Tuesday, who will also be sharing um, news about the campaign. We'll continue to be working with Jane H um, to do PR over the course of the campaign week, and of course, continue to share over 1,000 charities all working together to share that hashtag Christmas Challenge 22 um, hashtag. And then continuing over the week to do more socials, do more emails and continue to share charity posts and charity impact. So again, this is just a few of the headline things that we're doing, but it's a packed week. And if you haven't already, it'd be great to start planning how is your, how is your week gonna go and what, what prep can you do beforehand? Great, I'll stop sharing here so we can open up to questions. Great. Uh, we do have one question from Tamsin Weimar from African Children's Fund. She asks, we find local news outlets aren't interested in international development charities, even those based in a small local area. Are there any tips for approaching uh, local, um, local news outlets as an international development organisation? Um, I don't know how political you're prepared to get, but obviously the if you can indicate to them that you're prepared to talk about na some national issues like uh, the 0.7% GDP target, uh, we have a new overnight, a new international development minister, Andrew Mitchell, back in post, and the assumption is that he wouldn't have taken that job unless 0.7% was back on the table. So um, if you're prepared to um, talk about uh, the importance of foreign aid and the importance of that target, um, that might be a route in because it's obviously going to be very topical at a time of spending restraint elsewhere. That'd be my tip. Great. Um, should press release be in a body of the email or should you send it as an attachment when you're sending it out? Well, I can, I can maybe answer this and hope James agrees. I would definitely put it in the main body of an email. Um, journalists are inundated with press releases, they're inundated with PR requests. One less click, it, it just makes it easier for them to see. They don't need to open a Word, a prettily formatted Word document. You can, you can still do perfectly good formatting in the main body of an email. So the key is to have a succinct and eye-catching subject um, line in your email subject, uh, and then, you know, right at the top of the page, eye-catching headline and the first two paragraphs, really important. You don't need to put it in a Word document or PDF of a Word document, just put it in the main body of a text and get straight to the point. Just to add to that, um, make whatever format you use, make it easy to cut and paste because journalists like to be able to do that. They don't want to have to copy out from a PDF the quote from your CEO. So cut, cut and paste for speed, make sure you can you facilitate that in whatever format you use. Yeah, I was gonna say, if a charity has a story for a particular day or maybe let's use the Crystal Challenge week as an example, they want it to come out around then, how much time in advance should they send something to um, someone in the news? It depends a bit on the obviously there are different rhythms for different types of um, publications. So if it's a weekly paper, you need to find out when their deadline is um, and approach a journalist. I, I think going too far ahead, uh, you know, I would never really approach someone more than a week ahead because it's quite likely that they'll have lost uh, focus on what you're talking about and moved on to another story by the by the time they get around to their deadline. I mean, ideally give people a couple of days notice. I would try and approach people two or three days ahead of when you're aiming to land something. Um, I mean, again, thinking about local broadcast, that has a slightly longer lead time because um, uh, TV crews or radio interviews, that sort of thing, take a bit more logistical planning. So perhaps try and give them a bit more notice. And should you do then follow-ups if you haven't heard back, um, would you recommend at least doing a follow-up or two, or should you just leave it with a chance and listen for them to hear back from them? 
James, you, you can answer. I didn't that. hear all of that. How quickly should you follow up? Is that the question? Yes, basically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does annoy journalists if you follow up too quickly and they haven't, you know, as George says, they will be inundated with stuff. And particularly local journalists are, you know, there's this star, staff has been, staff levels have been denuded. Um, so there's more pressure on them than, than ever. Um, I wouldn't ever follow up some follow up more than a, a, a sooner than a day. So give so at least give a journalist 24 hours. I think after that point, a, a brief follow up email saying, "Wonder if you've seen this and had a chance to consider it is fine." Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't repeatedly harass a journalist. Probably one, probably one follow up would be what I would limit it to. Yeah, I totally agree because it does aggravate some. The reality is, if they want to get back to you they'll just go this looks great thanks very much can you tell me a bit more or this is great can i speak to your guy tomorrow at 2 30 or tomorrow afternoon and they will know what it piques their interest and they'll get back to you accordingly and as james says you don't want to annoy them so yeah i think follow up once and and you know the the day after you've sent it don't send the press release and ring them two hours later if they haven't got back to you because they're just not going to it doesn't work like that yeah and also one one trick is in a follow-up is to say if this isn't for you, if you're not the right person to address this to, please put me in touch with a relevant colleague, because it may be that you've not actually identified the right journalist who writes on a particular area, and um, you might prompt someone to pass it on to someone else who might have more time or more interest in what you in the story you're pushing. And a quick one on terms of disseminating press releases: we've all done it, where you've got you know 78 names on your your pr target press list and you put the all of their email addresses in bcc so no one can see who is doing it. but it's far better and far more impactful and far more likely to get a response if you can put hi charlie or dear charlie um i know you've written about x cause in the past so i thought the below may be of interest make it personal make it relevant make show that you read their copy in their article and it so you're not just spam emailing them as opposed to the, oh it's yet another press release from a pr i don't know from a charity i've never heard of it's this pr has bothered to read my copy knows i've written about mental health or the environment or whatever it might be homelessness and you've bothered to tailor it and just takes you know, it takes 10 minutes of Google searching, looking at that paper's website, seeing the journalist, who's the right person, which you frankly should be doing in any case to make sure you've got the right person on your press list. And then you just tailor it. And it might well take you twice as long to send out that press release this way. But there's probably half a dozen key guys at either the charity trade press or in your local, your three local broadcast targets and your three uh, local weekly or trade uh, newspapers in your area. And if you do that, you're probably going to get a better pickup. And just a tip on that is that there are mail merge tools that you can use, which can sort of speed up making those emails personalized. Um, so you can send out in bulk, but you can tailor certain sections of emails according to the person you're sending it to. So that can also help, that tool can help um, when you do that. Um, we had a question here. You mentioned the importance of an image, but what about if we have service users, for example, who need to remain anonymous due to high risk cases that um, they deal with? Uh, do you have any advice there about how to use imagery in that in those situations? Um, I think that journalists are quite sensitive to that sort of issue, and they will be willing to talk to people on occasion, if there's a good reason for it, anonymously. So, um, and use or use it or change a name, you'll quite often see an article where you'll see an asterisk at the bottom of the piece saying names have been changed. Um, so don't be, um, don't think that you can't use individual or personal or compelling individual stories just because you've got to protect users' identities. I think journalists will understand that they will be sensitive to that and they will look to work with you to find a way around it and still still tell those compelling individual stories that people want to read and in terms of imagery specifically um you can maybe try and use a stock image because if the name's been changed and you can't use a photograph of that person obviously you can miss maybe use a stock image or uh if it's uh of I don't know, uh, it could be an old people's home or it could be in an institutional environment, maybe use the outside of the building. 
uh, or the logo or the image or something that might be a library picture. So if you can't use a picture of an individual who doesn't want to be, you know, doesn't want their name to be used and obviously can't use their picture, then think about that as an alternative option. Um, yeah. There was one um, question from Emma. It says, working for a homeless charity, it can be quite hard to include human interest stories in press releases. Do you have any other tips for creating a press release that stands out if we aren't able to, to include a specific case study? Well, I, I'd repeat part of the, the answer I just gave on the previous question. Don't be frightened of using anonymized stories and case studies. Um, I think people will be very open to that. Um, maybe to bring home the impact of what you're doing, offer to take a journalist out on the streets with you one evening, but agree in advance that they're not to use the real names of anybody they meet. That's the terms of allowing them to see behind the curtain and actually get an in, get a, a get a, that, you know, that would make a really compelling piece, a night on, you know, actually out and about with you, with you as a charity to see what you're doing on the ground, but agreed in advance that no, no individual's identities are used. I think journalists will be very open to that sort of agreement and discussion. And um, another thing is homelessness is on the rise. And if it's to James's point about the political, national political aspect, it's from a homelessness perspective, this is only stats, you know, homelessness is surging in the UK. In the last five years, there's been an X percent increase to X thousand in the UK. And in Kent or wherever your location is, there's been a Y percent increase. And your charity has been involved for this many years and has transformed the lives of this many people. So you can set the national scene, talk about how it's clearly a worsening national issue. And, and it probably is in your locality as well and say how you're doing it. And you can bring in some of those bigger picture narrative lines about homelessness and maybe what the government said, its latest initiative is to do this. But you know, you're already on the front line dealing with people trying to tackle this issue at the coalface so that's another way of bringing in some relevant contextual lines into your uh, pitch also if you can't use a case study of someone in currently in crisis which i think everybody would understand think about whether you can talk use the story of somebody who you've helped and has actually turned their life around but could talk about how they became homeless how it can happen to anyone and how your charities help them get them back on their feet so use someone who's willing to talk on that basis rather than somebody actually currently going through that crisis who might not want to talk to the media great thank you both sahil i don't know if you had any more questions that you wanted to pick out uh no i think that's it for the questions that i can see um i think we can wrap up here so i'll hand over to beth Great. Um, so firstly, just thank you to George and James for this really great webinar and some really insightful tips um, and, and information there. Just a reminder to everyone that this webinar was recorded, so we'll be able to um, put the recording and the slides out for you to see again um, if you want to review them. But otherwise, um, our next webinar coming up is our Ask Us Anything webinar, where you'll have a chance to ask all of the Big Give team all of your questions. That's coming up on a third that you can... Um, apply to um, take part in that now but otherwise thank you both um, for joining us today and I hope everyone has a lovely afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.